What's up everybody? This is Mike Manza with another Manza Faust Productions video. So today I'm going to dive into yet another reoccurring series on this channel. Uh, so this could kind of fall into the regional kind of based, uh, which I already did on uh, New York Hardcore. But uh, this also became such a worldwide phenomenon afterwards as a genre that, you know, I couldn't just keep it to the early Southern California kind of scene it grew out of. So, uh, yeah, so I'm talking today about power violence. And, you know, power violence really came out of this whole thing in the late 80s of hardcore punk becoming a lot more kind of, like, aggressive and a lot more, like, kind of sloppy and... A lot of the stuff that led to Grindcore, i.e. Siege, and Deep Wound, a lot of the early uh, DRI stuff, like dealing with it, uh, a lot of that stuff early on in the earlier on in the 80s, 85 and before, was really affecting a lot of these bands on the West Coast, and these bands wanted to play a lot more like kind of complicated music uh, the structures of these songs would go up and down a lot uh fast slow uh, rapid tempo changes kind of psychotic vocals very caveman-esque in the early days and this stuff was while grindcore was happening over in places like Detroit and also in the UK, you had a lot of stuff coming out of the West Coast that was a lot more based in that, but you had a slow, doomy kind of aspect to it, a lot like a lot of the early 90s bands that would come out of the sludge kind of music scene, like I Hate God and Grief out of Boston, a lot of that kind of like more murky dense kind of stuff was kind of happening around the same time a lot of this power violence was happening and they took influence from one another for sure they were doing splits together and everything like that but also you had a strong amount of uh, what you would call youth crew at the time stuff like youth of today and uh, up front wide awake uh, a lot of the bands coming out of Connecticut and New York at the time unity um, that early kind of what you would call like posi core these days and stuff like a lot of the very fast youth of today uh, a lot of influence from like stuff like seven seconds and uniform choice uh minor threat you would get uh, even ssd control you would get these like more aggressive kind of fast um bands coming out of, like I say, Connecticut and New York, off of stuff like Revelation Records. Also in the West Coast, you had stuff like Chain of Strength and the aforementioned Uniform Choice. So there was a lot of this stuff happening, and it all just kind of came together in, um, you know, the L.A. scene. And a lot of these bands would pick this up, but also, it, you know, put in a bit of, like, weird kind of jazz, the musicianship on a lot of these records is wicked fast, but there's a lot of complexity to it. There's a lot of different kind of ideas that hardcore punk wouldn't really dive into at this point. So these bands were way ahead of the curve. curve. And, like, I think it's interesting because you know, it was still in that time, like, hardcore was kind of, like, dead in the early, in the late 80s, you know, it was this type of thing, it was almost like a dirty word, all these bands out of Boston, DYS and SSD and all, all those kind of bands, either stuck, like, really close to the kind of hardcore sound, stuff like uh, Slapshot, which grew out of negative FX, and uh, bands like that. But then you also had like Jerry's Kids, DYS, and SSD Control coming out with these really out there kind of like, like very, like DYS was trying to be Van Halen at the time. Uh, S 
SSD controllers coming out on stage looking like fucking Motley Crue and playing slow. And it really just, like, kind of splintered the scene off. You know, New York hardcore was kind of blowing up, but that fell more into, like, a crossover kind of thing with stuff like uh, Cause for Alarm and uh, Age of Quarrel by the Cro-Mags and everything like that. So... And there is a bit of metal influence in Power Violence, not to the extent that Grindcore would have. It's around the same time that the, a lot of those bands were starting out in the early 80s, in the late 80s. And it just had a lot more kind of diversity in the sound. Like I said, uh, you think of those early Grind records, Scum by Napalm Death or Brutal Truth early stuff, you think of Terrorizer, World Downfall. A lot of these albums have like one speed and they're just constantly going off the rails, and fast as fuck, uh, Repulsion, with, um, with Horrified. All these albums are just constantly just like grinding on. When Power Violence, you have these like kind of jarring at the time uh, tempo shifts. You know, it would go from lightning fast. You got a lot of these bands doing like 15 to 30 second long songs. And then the next song will be this like slow, brooding, three minute jam of just some guys screaming very caveman Neanderthal style over, you know, just like these slow, brooding, down, uh, detuned riffs and stuff. And these riffs would have a lot of that free jazz. Um, kind of influence to them. People like, uh, you know, bass was very important in this genre. People later on, like Chris Dodge, early on you had people like Eric Wood coming out of Man is the Bastard and Charred Remains. And probably the band that started it all off, um, you know, technically it was Neanderthal. And Neanderthal would eventually become Charred Remains and that would kind of turn into Man is the Bastard gradually. And Neanderthal has a very strong, like, bass sound, very unique bass sound at the time. He, Eric Wood would play these, like, kind of slide chords and almost play it like a, like a, um, I, I don't know how to describe it, but it's got this kind of, like, thing to it, which would become a big thing in the power violent sound throughout the 90s, and... It's just this immediately, like... And the Neanderthal stuff is very kind of mid-tempo, very chuggy. Uh, and it does get, like, kind of mid-tempo fast a, a few times. But I think when it really does become, like, thrashy and just kind of short, sharp shock of, like, kind of things like DRI and uh, Siege, um, you get into what people mostly think of when they think of power violence. And a lot of the modern-day bands that, you know, kind of fly the flag of this power violence movement, you really hear, like, that more thrashy, uh, going into the early 90s kind of sound. And one of the bands I feel like is a huge part of the modern kind of power violence revival, and a lot of the bands name check this band like crazy. And it's probably one of my favorites. I wish I had a better copy of it because this is kind of like a crummy bootleg. But uh, we got crossed out, and this is sort of like a bootleg discography, 7-inch, um, just furiosity all the way through, um, you got, like, a lot of just, like, really short songs, 15 to 25 seconds, whatever the hell, and then you got the, the slower, doomier kind of stuff, like, uh, He-Man, and, uh, Crown of Thorns, and all these kind of songs where it does slow down to this kind of, like, Neanderthalic kind of sludge, and you can hear a lot of, like, people take from this, even in 
sort of like the thrash core, fast core, whatever you want to call it, kind of stuff of the mid '90s, where you would go, and even like some of the like early metallic hardcore kind of stuff of the early '90s, where you would have these like very like ferocious kind of like sludge parts, which does kind of come out of like in the early 80s, you would have this whole movement of stuff coming off of like Pentagram and going into stuff like Witchfighter General and St. Vitus. And uh, some of these bands like St. Vitus would end up on um, SST and all these other kind of labels that punk bands would, you know, gravitate to. Um, so all these influences are happening and you can hear it in Crossed Out. You can hear the ultra lo-fi. Sounds like it's recorded in a fucking cave. It's very Neanderthal and just crusty as all fuck. But it doesn't fall into that, you know, crust punk as it was at the time. A lot of the stuff like Deviated and Instinct and Amoebics. You have a very, like, street level kind of almost thuggish kind of attitude to a lot of it while still having that kind of, you know, like very raw, very dirty, feedbacky um, kind of element to it. And it's great. If you haven't checked out Crossed Out, it's like amazing stuff. You can hear a lot of what would come after it. And they have, like, a giant influence on not only power violence and the whole revival kind of thing, but also in, like, a lot of this early 90s kind of stuff happening, you know? So, but the band that would really push it into, like, um, you know, a lot of attention of people within hardcore would definitely be probably, like, the band that everyone thinks of in Power Violence. That's Infest. This is their Slave LP, I believe, from 91 or 90. And this is just ferocious, very, like, uh, Joe Denun Denunzio, the singer, would do this straight-up, like, kind of more Neanderthal, like kind of like the uh, crossed out 7-inch or the crossed out material. Very much like that, but he would involve a lot of the like kind of caterwaul of stuff coming out of New York like Youth of Today. Very much a Ray Capo Youth of Today kind of Rah! kind of element to it. So you got that kind of caveman but he's going so much higher with it and doing this, like, kind of spazzy stuff. And to this day, Infest puts on one of the best live shows. Denunzio is in, like, the fucking crowd the entire time, just screaming at you. He's probably, like, in his 50s by now, and it's just some of the most, like, fucking urgent and, like, chaotic fucking music of its time. You got some short-ass songs, but then you also have stuff like Sicko, which has this very powerful build-up and uh, just goes fucking raging and then breaks down again and has this kind of groovy kind of, you know, bridge area and then goes thrashing as fuck again. You always have, like, the last track on a lot of these albums. This one has the song Fetch the Pliers, which I believe is about three minutes, three and a half maybe. And this is the more doomy jam kind of thing, and the stereotype of a lot of these albums is they always end with, like, a ridiculously long, like, kind of slow, brooding, like, sludge jam, like, bands would do, like, entire sides of the other, uh, the other side of the record would be just this giant slow jam, that's probably the length of the rest of the album, you know, like, 20 songs and then one, and it's cool, because you, you do have that variety and it's very unique in that early thing, because, like I said, like there was that divide between metal of all sorts and punk. Like these two things, and you know, hardcore came out of the punk scene. These two elements would not get along over here. You know, I don't know what it was like in fucking. I mean, I don't know what it was like in the '80s either. I wasn't alive yet. But you know, if you look at stuff like 
you know, the grindcore scene over in England, a lot of these bands would, or the, a lot of these fandoms would, like, kind of mix and mingle a bit more than they would over here. That's why you have stuff like Bolt Thrower and the Napalm Death and all these kind of bands that, you know, were very much involved in the crust scene and would, you know, cite a lot of those bands, but they were also very much into heresy and ripcord and they were also probably listening to a lot of like onslaught and all the other crazy metal stuff that was happening at that time a little bit more uh, hell bastard and axe grinder would take a lot from those kind of sounds as well so and like in fast you don't get as much metal like the guitar definitely sounds metal you got a really interesting like bass like a, like the, the way they record the bass on this album is very like kind of cool, clicky, and it sounds very cool, though. It's got this very raw, like, kind of, like, little bit of, like, a gallop to it, and it's just great. This has, like, a ton of bangers, you know, Machismo, Sick of Talk, Where's the Unity, Mindless, Which Side, Sick and Tired, Life's Halt, you know, you take any of these songs, they've been covered like a billion fucking times, but they're just so, you know, much of a snapshot of what power violence is and what made this fucking genre great is just that youthful energy, but, you know, it's evolving, you know, like I said, you got that more experimental touch of the slow, fast kind of thing, so... Another, you know, hugely influential band from this time uh, that I mentioned before in uh, Neanderthal is Man is the Bastard, and this is their early, like, Charred Remains sort of stuff. Uh, I believe this is taken from two different records. I'm not so sure. And this goes a lot more into the kind of experimental stuff that uh, Eric Wood would be doing with stuff like Neanderthal early on, or even his other side project, uh, which was more of an instrumental kind of jazz core kind of thing called Cyclop. You have these insane kind of like very like almost like Charles Mingus-y sounding bass riffs, but played electrically, you know, Charles Mingus would usually play a stand-up bass. These guys, you know, Eric Wood is playing more slide kind of stuff and making in all this kind of weird sound. And then, you know, you have the, the vocalist just going fucking ape shit. You got a lot of the same kind of tropes that you would have with bands like Infest and Crossed Out a little less simplified, you know, it's, it's got those dynamics, but at the same time, it's, you know, so much more complex, and the fucking musical ideas they're coming up with are so avant-garde to that fucking time period, um, and also, they were the ones that coined the term power violence, I don't know if it's, I don't think it's on the, yeah, there's a song on one of the early EPs, can't remember the title of it. Um, I think it's HSMP, but uh, the beginning of it has them naming off a shit ton of bands and then saying West Coast you know, power violence was fucking go. And that became the calling of all of the bands that came after it playing this style. And it gave that genre title. You know, it's Eric Wood shouting it out during a live set or whatever, however that was recorded. It definitely sounds live. A lot of this stuff sounds like it was recorded live, and it was probably recorded on a live setup. You know, it's still a studio kind of situation. There's not really a crowd or anything, but they're probably still recorded on the same exact kind of stuff that would be recorded for a live show, you, you know, the mix board and everything like that. So one of those bands that... Uh, would would call out on that famous song was Capless Casualties. And Capless Casualties really took a lot of this early stuff and just 
sped it up even further. So this falls more into less of like dealing with it and more of that first uh, DRI LP, the Dirty Rotten EP or whatever the hell it's called, where it's like 22 songs in like eight minutes. This falls more into that. It's just very chaotic, very, it's mostly fast kind of stuff. There's a couple of like more mid-tempo kind of songs, but this still kind of has this like very thrashy kind of vibe to it. You know, you got the dual singers, which would become a big thing in the 90s. You know, trading off vocals. You had a lot of bands coming off of the uh, profane existence kind of sound and a lot of scold and all these like late 90s, like more of the like Minneapolis kind of cross the Portland kind of stuff. And this is like very cool. This is uh, Subdivisions and Ruin. So this is their second LP, I believe. And it's just insane. The, the, and one of the things about, I don't have the insert on this, but one of the things about power violence, like, there might be, like, a kind of way to view it that's more of, like, a straight-edge-based movement, but it's really not. A lot of these guys were stoners. You have a lot of, like, you know, drinking and weed element and lyrics in these bands. Crossed Out has a a song called Homegrown, you know, Eric Wood talks about weed a lot and stuff. Uh, Capitalist Casualties does fall a little bit more into like a straight edge kind of thing, but the imagery of it, you got the like intense, like this images of people shooting up and slitting their wrists and all this other very intense, like urban decay, just guttural kind of stuff going on in the imagery and it just paints this picture of that early 90s LA scene as just disgusting and drug addicted and just misanthropic as all fuck and it does give that extra kind of like it's that urban decay man it's got that fucking evil like you have a lot of these bands were involved in like street shit and like gang activity and stuff like that which brings us to one of the other big bands from that era who really did push it forward again you have the dual vocals this time male and female and it's just insanely like volatile this band is probably one of the like most disturbing and like frightening power violence bands, but I feel like they really do carve out a sound early on that really did get brought over into the later stuff, you know, you got that intensity, they do have like a really good fast slow, fast slow dynamic, and it's a lot tighter than some of the bands like Man is the Bastard, where they would kind of go off on stuff for a little bit, this is very much more concise and tight as fuck, and all about that kind of brutality. And I don't think this band uh, played live very much in their early years, but nowadays you can see them all the time. They always go on tour. I haven't caught them yet because I'm always fucking up, but uh, I despise you. And uh, this band's pretty big for having um, in its ranks Chris Elder, who would... Uh, I like this, like, gatefold, by the way, where they're doing the kind of suicidal tendencies style uh, custom shirts. <laughs> Very cool. Um, this is put out by Tank Crimes. This is a compilation of all their early, um, all their 90s uh, seven inches splits. Uh, I believe they had an LP. Um, and this is just on forgiving, like, this is just some of the most, like, fucking, like, evil-sounding shit, the lyrics are very, like, in your face, and just, like, don't give a fuck about anything, you know, you, you have, like, lyrics about this shit going down in the streets, people getting murdered, people getting off, and it's just like, this is what, like, you know, this is what we deal with every day, and it's kind of this cold, straightforward, almost kind of like a power violence version of what you would get with stuff like Madball and Marauder and all this stuff coming out of 
New York City that would lead to more of like the beatdown kind of stuff, which is just like not so much tough guy, just this kind of just extreme misanthropy and extreme uh, cynicalism. You know, it's this this just kind of just bleak worldview. And this would be a huge ban because. They did a split with uh, a split LP later on with um, uh, and agoraphobic nosebleed, and agoraphobic nosebleed was definitely big in those days of really spearheading the cyber grind, you know, ultra fast like drum machine kind of stuff, and they would crank out stuff like crazy, and they really fit with this band because agoraphobic nosebleed and also the stuff that. Um, some of the members would do with Pig Destroyer, which is a much bigger band. Uh, but Agoraphobic Nosebleed would really fit with this band just because it's those lightning fast, kind of short, angry, like just misanthropic bursts. But also at the same time, you got this kind of street drug, you know, kind of vibe and violence, gang violence. And it's, just, it's the street. And it's just authentic as it can get. It's not putting on a show. It's just telling you straight up, people are dying out here. People are getting killed, and you don't give a fuck. It's very much almost like a gangster rap. You got some of that early gangster rap kind of stuff, like Ice-T and N.W.A., where it's extreme, and it gives you these stories that are just brutal, and it just has this unblinking, unflinching, just like, yep, this is how it is, you can't fucking deal with it, get the fuck out, we don't need you. So, in all of this, probably the definitive band throughout the rest of the 90s, just extremely important, is of course, Spaz. And Spaz came out of a few different bands. You had Chris Dodge, who had come out of uh, the San Francisco area, I believe, and he had been involved in a band called Sticky. And then you had another uh, member, Max Ward, on drums. And he had come out of Plutocracy, which was another band that was pretty important to this. I feel like they fall more into like the grindcore, thrashcore kind of thing. But they were very big for having the hip-hop influence in there a lot more. Like, they'd have DJ breaks and different shout-outs from MCs and stuff, and you had a lot of that hip-hop attitude, some of, like, the slang of L.A. at the time. Uh, and they would also be huge for the implementation of sampling, whether it's from, like, old kung fu movies or gangster films or, like, graffiti documentaries and all this kind of stuff. And Spaz would take this along with, you know, the influence from Infest and uh, Man is the Bastard and all these and just put it down into this very concise, very complex again. This is a band that I don't think gets enough credit on how weird and complex and like kind of difficult these like songs and riffs and everything like that they'd have like seven inches where they'd bring on like a random saxophone solo or a guy playing banjo or this weird flute thing and it's just it's insane like there's one that has like an electric accordion it sounds like and they would have the samples of, you know, different, like, after-school specials or the skateboard videos. And it's just hilarious lyrics. You got a lot of, like, inside jokes. Uh, the whole band is, like, their own characters, all three of them, you know. And they all have their own vocal parts on each of these songs. It almost has a vibe of Beastie Boys, where they would trade off vocals per line and stuff like that. It's just a raging kind of blast of energy and it's just great and all these guys would go on to start amazing things afterwards you've got like max ward starting 625 thrash and doing all this great work with like japanese bands i believe he lived in japan for a real long time they're all like serious record collectors uh chris 
from this band would go on to play in like every fucking power violence band. He was in Hell Nation for a while. I saw him when he was playing in Infest when uh, Despise You started playing live. He would play bass in there as well. And an early uh, part of that band's live experience. And it's just, he, he's uh, such a grand, like, kind of celebrity within it. You got Dan Lactose as well on guitar, who would go on to become uh, more of a DJ, like a hip-hop guy. He still does stuff like Hard Foul, which is a lot more in this, like, fast core, thrash core, power violence kind of vibe. But he also really became huge for having a part in uh, the, the group. I believe it's him and a, a rapper named Grand Invincible. And if you get the chance, check out that Grand Invincible LP from two years ago. It's fucking phenomenal. Uh, real good, like, L.A. hip-hop, like, very old-school sounding. And, you know, you would have guys, like do, like, shout-outs on these records. One of them, you got uh, Caden from Hyrax, which was kind of, like, a big... They had all these kind of, like, jo inside jokes and stuff, and one of those guys that would always come out was Caden of Hyrax. You had Cool Keith doing a shout-out on their second album. And it's just got this kind of... Very chaotic, but, you know, it's all very perfectly planned out. You got all the, the like kung fu samples they would watch kung fu theater and just record off the television or however you did it back then and just make these chaotic kind of sounds and this is definitely a band that would like involve a lot of different things chris had slap a ham records and spaz in particular would do splits with fucking everybody and they would also release stuff by, you know, Grief and I Hate God and Despise You and all these bands from, you know, their scene, but also, like, spread out. And slap ham is really influential early on because they had released the Pillsbury Hardcore split with Infest, which is probably the first, like, kind of Infest material that was available in, like, I think, like, 88 or 89 at that point. And they would also be very influential in taking it out of that central, like, L.A. kind of thing that, you know, people associated with power violence at the time. And you get bands out of DeKalb, Chicago kind of area, like Charles Bronson and... Holy shit, this is, like, one of the best Power of Violence records ever made. Probably one of my favorite, like, hardcore punk records ever made. This is Youth Attack. Charles Bronson took the sample-heavy kind of thing that Plutocracy and Spaz were doing and just made it a lot more, like, their own thing. So a lot of these albums, you would have, like, a theme to the samples, you know, a lot of these albums, they just throw a shit ton of samples on, but this would always have a theme, it almost told, like, this kind of story, there's, like, different, uh, sample, you know, there's a variety of samples through this, because this is a lot more of, like, the LP kind of thing, but there was the split they did with Spaz that has a lot of samples out of Rosemary's Baby, you have a lot of these, like, after school, like, anti-drug kind of things, and I guess, like, you could, like, throw this into, like, a youth straight-edge kind of thing. Like, this band is, like, probably, like, more intense than something like Spaz or Infest. Just being honest, like, the vocals are a lot more, like, kind of, like, unhinged and, like, psychotic. Like, Mark McCoy really does, like, fucking rip this shit apart, and it's got that very, like, social kind of, like, socioeconomic kind of stance, to, you know, bent to it, you know, it's very kind of, like, you know, it, it's got its silliness to it, you know, and the band's called Charles Bronson, it did start this whole kind of movement of bands being named after some random, you know, action hero or celebrity or something like that. 
and it, it's almost like this anti-corporate, anti-materialist kind of thing to it. And I just love this stuff, man. Like, man, like Charles Bronson is probably one of the best. Uh, so, and and also, you had internationally things started to happen, and you would get bands like. Fuck on the Beach, and this is their Endless Summer LP, put out by Slapaham, and this is great, this is an insanely fast, it, it kind of falls into a fast core thrash core, but also has a strong amount of power violence influences, and just, you know, great songwriting too, it's extremely catchy, um, just you know, they would do it very Japanese, though. There was this whole Japanese thing in the in the 80s and 90s. Where, like, the, all these bands would put everybody else to shame. It's just so much more intense, a lot more, like, fast. There was another band that did a split with Spaz called Romantic Gorilla from Japan, who's awesome. And they would really influence a lot of the, like, female-fronted kind of power violence that you would get later on. And even some of the, like, female-fronted hardcore you have now, like Gel and um, a lot of that kind of uh, tupa-tupa crap that pe people really like. That I, you know, I dig a lot. I don't know what that um, type of punk is called. They have, like, all this chain punk and egg punk and all these kind of subgenres now and stuff. They're, but you, you can hear a lot of, like, influence from some of this Japanese stuff and... You know, a lot of these great bands. You had a lot of other stuff happening in the 90s as well. You had bands like Hell Nation. You had No Comment, who was a very early one. I don't have any of their material, but they're awesome as well. They almost fall into the kind of crossed out kind of thing. But they would even be moving more into sort of like the stuff that Despise You was doing later on with that kind of street feel to it and very raw kind of stuff. So... You know, throughout the 90s, you had bands kind of hanging low. I remember hearing about a lot of this stuff during the whole revival era that was happening. Um, and you had a bunch of really big bands coming out of different areas of the country that would take that early, the sound of Infest and Man is the Bastard and Spaz and, again, push it further so you had stuff going into more like a hardcore, like metallic hardcore of stuff like Chokehold and, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff coming out of New York with like Madball and Crown of Thorns uh, with more of that like hip-hop kind of vibe. Um, so, you know, like, and it's just, you had a lot of these bands coming out that were very experimental still and would fall more into the Man is the Bastard kind of camp of stuff. And you get stuff like Iron Lung. And, yeah, this is just full-on, like, relentless fucking hardcore. Like, like, unforgiving it's like two guys one of them on guitar one of them on drums like one of the best bands i've ever seen live i saw these guys open for infest uh back in 2016 and it was just fuck it you know just clocky in the fucking face good ass shit you know just don't give a fuck about anything and they would you know they had the slow like kind of like chuggy, sludgy stuff that would fall more into that man is the bastard kind of vibe, but they still know how to thrash like crazy. And another band that would come later, and this is more into the, like, MySpace era, when all, a lot of these bands would start getting discovered, you know, like YouTube came around, and more people would get into this kind of crazy power violence stuff. And one of those bands that really had a giant you know, impact on people was Weekend Nachos, and I believe these guys are from Chicago, so you, you got sort of that, like, connection to stuff like 
uh, Charles Bronson, another great band from that era that came out of the same spot, which is a little, like, less power violence as time goes on and more into, like, straight ahead kind of hardcore is uh, Harm's Way. And uh, I think they're doing a kind of new metal-y kind of stuff now. But Weekend Nachos definitely has that sludge part to it, and they go extremely fast and extremely slow. you got the very denunzio influence like vocals um you know you got the great samples and a lot of that kind of stuff so weekend nachos you got stuff like shitstorm paranoid existence this might fall more into like a grindcore kind of thing but i thought these guys were really cool um just one of those bands that came out of that whole revival kind of scene. Uh, you know, a lot of these bands do splits with, like, shit tons of other bands and get those bands exposure. I wanted to also reference Wound Man. This is the Perimeter LP from, I believe, 2016. And this is another band I've seen a few times. Uh, they opened for Infest on that show down in Philly. Nice artwork on that. Again, this falls very tightly into the Iron Lung, Sludgy, a little bit of, uh, you know, that, that classic grief and I Hate God kind of vibe. Um, News Crush and Corrupted, all those kind of bands as well that I forgot to mention. And going more international again, going over to Australia, which seems to have like a lot of extreme music coming out of it. You got a lot of great death metal and grindcore and even black metal that's come out of that country. And a lot of great power violence. You had a whole scene of different types of stuff like uh, white male dominance and all these kind of bands. And one of the biggest ones, and I'm going to end it with this, by the way, but you got Extortion. I believe they're from Melbourne. And this band is very prolific. I, they just put out a record last year called Seething, which is amazing. And these guys, uh, you got that nice purple. These guys, you know, again, it's extremely fast, extremely thrashy, and... Uh, it's a lot more straightforward, but it does have a lot of influence from those kind of bands. You've got also stuff like Coke Bust and Antichrist Demon Core, and you had a lot of these bands that would carry the flag of that early 90s great power violence sound, and it really does, you know, turn a lot of people on to the classics like Infest and all the others, Man is the Bastard and stuff, and now it's kind of like its own scene throughout the world unto its own. And, you know, it's it's a lot of debate goes on within, you know, power violence, whether it should be called that or whether it should be its own thing. Um, but it's very cool to see these young kids, and then you have generations of bands coming up with Weekend Nachos and Harm's Way and uh, Antichrist Demon Core and all these like early, uh, you know, early 2000s kind of bands that would come up through, you, you know, YouTube and social media and MySpace and early Facebook and they would kind of become like memes, you know, they were kind of the precursor to what we think of with internet memes, you know, to take all these different elements of popular culture and pervert them and make them just kind of screwed up and yeah man so that's power violence i want to get into like a lot of genre stuff i got a shit ton of grind core that's probably going to be its own sub series to all of this i got more um you know regional discussions i want to do something on boston I want to do something on the uh, Midwest, Detroit, Chicago kind of thing with bands like Negative Approach and the Necros. I want to go to Texas and talk about MDC, early DRI, Big Bla uh, big Boys, and uh, a 
lot of that kind of stuff. Want to go international over to Finland and talk about a lot of my favorite stuff out of there. Probably going to do a whole bunch of stuff on Japanese hardcore and all the different varieties you have there. And that's a very regional, onto its own country. You know, there's all these different regions with their own unique sounds throughout Japan. Um, Sweden, you know, a lot of that Mob 47 uh, kind of stuff. And, you know, I want to get into more labels, you know, as stuff like. Victory Records in the 90s is a very big one for me. Revelation, uh, Eugene, which was like a smaller label out of Connecticut, putting out stuff like The Pissed and Vomit Punks. And, uh, yeah, so, like, you know, anybody wants to see anything, you know, drop me a request in the comments and stuff and tell me, you know, like, within these, like, kind of genre guides and everything like that, you know, I also want to jump into, like, soundtracks and stuff, you know, you do like segments on compilations. I think compilations are a big undersung part of a lot of these scenes, you know, you find out a lot about different music through compilations, uh, just right off the bat, good power violence compilation is Possessed to Skate, there's two of them, and they're great, they have like Charles Bronson Spaz, all the great bands, and they also have a lot of like the second tier bands, like Monster X. So, you know, if you can find those, pick those up, and they're, they're fantastic, and, you know, this shit holds up, you know, and everybody who loves extreme music in this day and age does kind of owe it to a lot of these bands and stuff. I also want to do, like, a future video on emo violence, you know, there's so much I can do, I could go on forever of all the different videos I want to do in the future. So yeah, if you got any requests or suggestions of a topic, any feedback, a lot of the feedback I've been getting is awesome and I appreciate it immensely. Uh, put it down there in the comments, you know, like and subscribe, do all that good shit. If you want to find me on social media, I'm on Instagram as the Hordes of Manzerfaust. I have a link tree on there. You can find all my different places on that. And, uh, yeah, that'll about do it for this Power of Violence Deep Dive. So, once again, I am Mike Manzo with Manzo Faust Productions. Stay fucking punk, y'all.